I make this public. And so. All right, folks, if you can hear me, can y'all just put something in the notification so I know that my sound is working right? Because I have no idea if you hear me. So. Okay, it does work. Can you guys hear me? I can't tell if I, my sound is working right. Uh, all right, can y'all hear me? I need somebody to say something in the chat. I have no idea if you can hear me or not. I can't see my mic. Give me any feedback. Is this on? Oh, okay, perfect. Awesome. Cool beans. I will be right back. Sit tight and we will start in a second. Let me grab something. All right, folks. All right, who's in the chat? Let's find out. Let me give my little hellos in real quick. All right, it's a lot of y'all already. All right, so let's see what's going on. Courtney, thank you for that heads up. By the way, I need um maybe like five or six. Oh, actually, Alan's already one. Perfect. I guess if you're already on here, you're already a moderator. Boom. Good job, Alan. Um, Kimya, Black First News Media, what's up? Captain Ramsey. FFAOS now. Oh, yeah, I, I recognize your username. Um, Kalana. Who's this? Lord Fraser. Courtney Henderson, Desmond Minhurst. John Tracy. L. Johnson, 1908. Um, Demon. Arlene. What's up, y'all? Girl Interrupted. Hill. Movies. Oh, I, oh, somebody said Galen doing the Super Bowl. Let me write that one down. I forgot about that. All right. Uh, let's see. Forgiveness Olympics. All right. See, Rose, you already know where I'm going with that. <laughs> uh, oh, no. Um, Lord Praiser, don't worry. I will address it the way I, I, I plan to, but I'm not going to attack anybody for what they believe in. But we will, we will address, um, we'll get to it. Don't worry. I will try to be as cordial as possible. Um, plus, my parents are ministers, or my mom was. So, um, Antoinette. Raven, what's going on, man? Um, Maxine, Jess Flea, or JSSPSS. That, you're from Washington, I think. I know you. Um, Akira. <laughs> Sean Turner ain't have it. Ain't no kumbaya mess. Y'all ready? Look, y'all ready to argue already. Dang, we supposed to start off nice and smooth and ease into everything. Y'all are <laughs> y'all like, ah, right, we ready to fight right now. All right. Um, yeah, we will address that, folks. So sit tight. Haven't heard about Aretha Franklin. I didn't hear about that. I'm gonna write that one down too. Uh, it's a lot of y'all. Thank you, Raymond. Look, I just want y'all to know, Raymond, Raymond be like rocking my album. I appreciate that. He'd be on all the, the little music related posts, giving me a shout out. So, yes, I appreciate that. Um, no, sorry, Jet. JSPS, you live in Atlanta. Who do I know? There's somebody with a similar username that's from Washington State. My bad. Um, but I recognize your username as well. So um, Marlon, yeah, I recognize you as well. Somebody said, hey, big head. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll start in about one more minute, and then we'll get it cranking. I was just trying to make sure everybody was on before I started. Hopefully, everybody is enjoying their um, Thursday going into Friday. I can't wait for the weekend to get here. I have to sleep. And I'm sleeping in all week. I'm not doing anything. This week, I'm just in the house. Sleep. I just need some rest. I'm tired. I'm burnt out today, too, but it's okay. Um, Jeremiah, what's going on? Somebody said, Candy said she's here for the drama. <laughs> uh, Y'all are funny. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and get into it. So, of course, we have to start with the obvious. Um, it's interesting that 
we saw the end results of the Amber Geiger trial. Geiger trial. I said a name wrong in my last video. Um, somebody was asking me if I was shocked about the verdict as far as her getting, um, I guess, 10 years. And I don't know. You know, the thing about it is, one, I knew she would, I knew they were going to convict her. They had to convict her because there was no way they were going to let her get off. It was just going to be too much of a, too much of a backlash, but I feel like with the sentencing, the sentencing was some BS because really we all know she's going to do like five years and some change because she's eligible to, eligible for parole in five years. Plus, I think she's going to appeal anyway. Like I, I'm really convinced that they're going to appeal, and, and, and there's that. Um, what else was I going to say in that situation? I, I just the issue I really have with the case is that again, because you have 50 different states and you have a bunch of different jurisdictions and you have a bunch of different ways that the law is interpreted depending on where you are. The judicial system is never really balanced because, you know, like in this situation, she got, what, five, ten years for killing somebody unarmed. And then, you know, in, in the same token, you had another individual who just got sentenced to, what, 55 years for a robbery? They didn't kill anybody, but they got 55 years. And then just depending on what state you're in or, or who's on the jury or how that works, there's some people who get, you know, a slap on the wrist. There's some people who get the book thrown at them. And so you just saw that that overabundance of, of just mercy given to Amber. I was like, you're killing me. Then when we get to this whole stage of what I want to jump into, which is the whole forgiveness Olympics, um, if I were to talk about the origins of where I think that comes from, and, and when I'm saying forgiveness Olympics, for those who may not be caught up on this case, long story short, there's a lot of backlash because Amber was sentenced you know, to her time, and there were three moments that kind of triggered a lot of people. Moment one was right as she was, you know, found guilty, you had the bailiff, who's a black woman, and she's coming and, you know, she's fixing her hair and, and trying to rub her on the back and here's some tissue and we're going to help you, you know, my sister, you're going to be all right, it's going to be all right, baby, you got it. And I'm kind of like, mm, you know, you over here fixing this lady hair like she's not about to go to jail, it ain't going to matter. Um, so you have that, then you have part two with, well, actually part two, I want to say is the judge, um, you know, just as she's getting ready to go, as far as Amber, getting ready to go serve her sentence and everything to judge you know, goes and gives her this big hug. This is after the brother speech, which I'll come to next. But the judge gives her this big hug. And, you know, she says something that none of us could, could tell because we couldn't hear it. And then she gives her her Bible and everything, you know, look forward to and, you know, use this to kind of guide, you know, or order your steps. Use this to order your steps. I don't know if that's what she said, but I'm just using that since I like that song. And then, of course, you had Botham John's brother, um, who really, how do I word this? I'm trying to, I'm trying to tread carefully how I explain this. I think people are allowed to grieve how they would like to grieve, but what you don't want to get in the habit of doing is falling into that trap of when we sensationalize the idea of black people always being so forgiving or so naive or so under so understanding whenever we're getting like just kind of screwed over. So the brother goes on the stand and he says this whole line about, you know, he forgives her. Um, he doesn't even really want to go to the jail, but, you know, that's just what's going to have to happen because, you know, he doesn't want her to go to jail because that's what the brother would want. Then the dad gets on there doing the press conference and the dad's talking about, you know, you know, I, I would even want to be her friend. I'm like, y'all just, <laughs> what? I mean, how does that work? What, y'all going to be hanging out playing dice and then y'all joking? Remember that time you killed my son? <laughs> You're so crazy. Like, it doesn't work like that. So the issue that I, that we're seeing is you have the romanticizing of black forgiveness. And it's not just with this case. You've seen it before. Um, I want to say it's the Walter Scott case. It's right when either it was Walter Scott or it was somebody else, something that happened around the same time as the Charleston Nine, Walter Scott. It was all around that kind of time period. But during that, one of the family members of Walter, I swear it was Walter Scott. If it's not Walter Scott, it's somebody else. But somebody, just know somebody's family member got shot unjustly. And so they're on the news. And I think it was on Don Lemon's show. And this is before Don Lemon finally got his wake-up call that he was still black. And so the first question he ends up asking that relative is, do you think you can forgive the killer? And I'm like, why is that a question? Because if I were to put myself in the shoes of that person, if somebody were to kill my younger brother and I'm on the news media talking about, you know, whatever happened or how our family's responding to everything, you don't get the right to ask me whether or not I forgive somebody for killing my brother. One, that's me and my own personal internal decisions to be made. It's nothing for me to share with everybody. And secondly, what's supposed to happen if I say no? Are y'all going to vilify me? Because at the end of the day, nobody's in those shoes that I'm in. And so we now have this romanticizing of black people always being so forgiven. And, and historically, we've always done that. Um, and I don't know if it's just it's just the way that black people are as a collective. We've just always been taught to be nurturing and loving because we know what it's like to be on the crappy end of the stick. However, we can't use that as a crutch all the time and let that be something that puts us in a place of always being naive. Because if, you, if we were to flip the script, 
if this was Botham John that killed Amber, I can guarantee you her family was not going to be on the stand talking about we forgive you and I want to be friends with you. I don't even want you to go to jail. And there was not going to be the, the bailiff fixing, uh, you know, brushing homeboy's waves, trying to fix it all in and everything like that. And the judge, when he came down, gave him no Bible or anything like that. He would have been one step from the death penalty. Because if you think as a black man, you're going to kill a white woman in Texas, of all places, and you're only going to get 10 years. Yeah, right. So I, just the whole forgiveness Olympics, it's, it, you're seeing it. And I think the origin, in my opinion, and you don't have to agree, I think indirectly and unconsciously we've been conditioned to believe that our existence serves as a threat to white people even when we're not trying to be a threatening part like a threatening entity what i mean by that is um what i saw with the brother what i saw with that judge and what i saw with the bailiff is almost like they're almost apologetic for being inconvenienced they're almost apologetic for being disenfranchised or, or having witness a setback on behalf of their community and because they don't want to shake the table too much and, and disturb the element of white comfortability or, or white people being comfortable, then there's that whole apologetic aesthetic people have. And, and I think you've seen that so many times where, have you ever been in like a black owned business before? And I don't know, somebody white comes in there and all of a sudden you kind of see some people change up. Now there's some black owned businesses, they be like, it is what it is. You come in here and you're going to get the same service as everybody else. But then there's some you go to and there's like a white person or somebody that will come in and they bring like the red carpet out. And I'm like, Oh, okay, all right. You know, they break the next. Hey, it's white folks in here. We got to come on. We all get it together. We got to straighten up. These good white folks is in here. Like that's kind of the vibe I was getting from what I saw with that case. And, and again, I think historically you've just seen so many situations where we've always been so nurturing and catering to people who stab us in the back all the time because this whole thing is bigger than Amber. This is systematic. This is structural. This is just historical. This is how things have always been. And if Botham, uh, Botham John's family were to go up there and rip her apart they would have been tearing the people up in the media, the whole family. It's funny how when he got killed, the first thing they did, like I said, in the last, in the news was that, you know, oh, he had THC in the system. He had weed in the system. And we already know THC does not make you aggressive. If anything, it makes you very tranquil. It makes you very calm. But, you know, they try to paint the narrative and say, he's the aggressor. He's dangerous. You know, she was afraid. And I'm like, she's a cop. What's she scared of? The way that they shoot everything all the time, what are you afraid of? You, with all the training and the combat and, and all of the other scenarios that you should have been able to see at this point in your career, because, you know, police, they're going and they're going in the houses when there's a breaking report and, you know, domestic abuse and all that. You should have been too shook to the point where somebody's in what you thought was your apartment and the first thing you do is start shooting because you were so afraid. And so, again, I think we have this almost perception, and it's not all of us, but there's a lot of people who do that because I saw two extremes when I was looking at um, just the response to how people were responding to the brother's comments. Some people are like, oh, this is beautiful. I love this. This is beautiful. And I'm like, you know what? I understand the idea of forgiveness, but you can forgive internally. It doesn't have to be something that's announced to the world. And I personally don't believe sometimes, I've, and I said this with the Charleston Nine as well, I don't believe that when these people kind of jump out and say, I forgive you, that they've even had time to process everything. I think it's almost, we've just been conditioned sometimes, especially if you did grow up in the church, you're conditioned to turn the other cheek, you're conditioned, you know, love thy neighbor, bring all this love and everything like that. And I think as black people, especially black Christians, those who are black Christians, you have to be careful to make sure you interpret what's in the Bible in a way that still puts you in a space where your matriculation on this earth still makes sense because at the end of the day, white evangelicals are not the same way as black Christians. You know what I mean? Apparently that we're all reading or everybody's reading the same Bible, but white evangelicals, listen, you've seen how they respond to things. There's no such thing as forgiveness and love. You saw 9-11 and they wanted everybody dead. Okay. You see them right now on the border and they, and they see a family hopping the border and they're out there with bats and everything, trying to push people back across the water. And those are the evangelicals. They're reading the same Bible that black Christians are reading. And so you're seeing a contrast in, what the perception of love is and what the perception of turning the other cheek is or, or loving thy neighbor. For evangelicals, in my opinion, it's selective with how they feel. For black folks, it's kind of like, I think, because religion was pushed on us so punitively, it's almost like we respond to everything in fear. You notice a lot of times in my, in my experience, as somebody who's grown up in the church, as someone whose mother was a minister and grandmother was like a choir director and aunt's, aunt was a deaconess and father was a deacon and I had to be an usher, and I had to be in the choir. And at one point I was a choir director too, which was a mess because I was, it, this is when I got out of college and I'm directing the choir hungover because choir practice was on Saturdays. Um, that's in the next podcast episode. I'm still trying to finish it. But anyway, religion to me was introduced in such a punitive aspect. Everything was you go to hell, you go to hell, you go to hell, you go to hell, you go to hell. 
on the flip side, when you go to a lot of white churches, it's always more of the God is forgiving, God is love, love thy neighbor, this, that, and the third. That's what they present. They may not always do that in reality, but that's what's presented. And then in the black church, everything, is, in my opinion, has always just been so punitive. You're seeing a shift as the generations change, especially with more millennials um, leaving the church. You're seeing a shift. And, and I do want to, I, I do feel that the church to an extent has been kind of complacent in a lot of situations that we have politically and a lot of issues that we have. Um, pretty much I'm side eyeing a lot of churches that are allowing some of these public figures to go into their spaces and pretty much corrupt whatever essence was in there with politics or, you know, with, with anything that is detrimental to the black collective. When you have candidates who really have no black agenda, who have no interest in uplifting anything associated with black folks, but you know, there's some churches that will allow people into their doors because the news cameras are going to be there. It's going to get their church some publicity. So, I mean, it goes on and it goes on. But going back to what I was saying, I, I just think, again, religion was so punitively taught to us that, and, and at the same time, when you're talking about how a lot of us would see white people, we saw them as, oh, we have to protect them. We have to coddle them because they're just so good to us. Like, that's kind of the mindset you see. And I don't want to shake the table too much, but I really see it within the diaspora. I see a lot more in the diaspora than I see it in the United States. So when you start talking about people who are from the continent or people from the Caribbean, you see it even more. But the piece that gets me is this. And some of y'all are not going to like this part. But again, you saw so many that were saying, oh, you know, forgive, turn the other cheek. It, this is our sister in Christ and all this, that, and third. And I'm like, okay, well, y'all don't have that energy with gay people. Like, you know, let somebody be gay coming to pitch y'all. Oh, hell no. Nah. And, and everything switches. All that love and forgiveness goes out the window. So I'm like, well, how does this work? So I, I think with all of that, you're seeing a whole, I think people just, America right now is already a hot mess. Race in America is a freaking hot mess. The experience of being black in America is a hot mess. And when you already add Christianity into the mix or any other religion into the mix, and, and you talk about perceptions and what people are expected to do, it's all chaos. And I think black people, we've been operating in a space of chaos, especially when it comes to how we see the world through our lens of religion for those who are Christians. Um, uh, again, nobody would have expected Amber Geiger's family to, to forgive Botham John or Botham John, if it was the other way around, if he killed her in her apartment. There wasn't going to be in, in any Olympics of, oh, we forgive you. It, no, they would have said the family was crazy because one, the family was going to do that in the first place. You know, they would have had a new law. There would have been some new law called Amber's Law. You know, they would have had a, a holiday named after Amber and everything. They would have made, especially in Texas, there would have been some more punitive laws that were put into place to make sure that this would never happen again and everything like that. Like, it, it's even like when you talk about, like, gun control. I always said for all the, the, the folks who are so gung-ho about guns, 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 and I'm not just talking about regular, you know, a pistol or nine mil or something, because a lot of people have those, but I'm talking to AR-15s and everything like that. I always said, you want to watch legislation come into play with an AR-15 and an AK-47? Let every black person in America have one. I bet you that every kind of law on the books will be <laughs> enforced at that point. Um, but yeah, so w with that whole situation, it, it was cringeworthy to watch. I can't tell the family how to mourn. I can't tell them how to grieve. I can't tell them how to see things, but it's just they're playing into that cycle that the world kind of perpetuates on us to, you know, behave in as far as that matter. We're expected to never hold a grudge. We're expected to always be forgiving and understanding, even though history has shown us. And we'll get to that when I talk about some of those books, like history has shown us that we've never been able to just exist in our own space with our own skin and have the freedom to just live. Every time we've done everything, anything, it's always there's a problem with it. Whether, it, whether whether it's our hair, how we look, how we speak, how we talk, what we have, where we come from, all of that. And so we're the only group, group of people who literally have to walk on eggshells to exist, which is what I was going back to earlier when I was saying that we're almost taught that our existence is a burden for other people. And that's why I think sometimes we're so skittish around white people. I'm not really like that anymore. I don't even care. And I'm like, it is what it is. What? What's, what's up? But, you know, it, it, that whole element of how you have that professional voice at work, you know, um, you know, you, you talk the way you talk amongst your friends, but if your office on, hello, um, how may I help you? <laughs> you see that with people all the time. You see that in the elevator. If you know that the white woman in the elevator is already nervous, I, like I don't even look at the people in my building sometimes because they act all skittish because they think I'm not supposed to live in here or something. I just like, when I get in the elevator, I'm just on my phone. Like, don't even look at me. Like, that, yeah. But, um, you know, again, we're taught that our existence, our presence is a burden. And so when I saw everything that happened in that courtroom, Everything from the bailiff going and fixing the lady's hair. I'm like, what are you fixing her hair for? For, for what? What? They, she already dyed it blonde to make her look less evil anyway, because she's not even blonde. Like, but of course, you know, if you have the blonde woman who's scorned, who's apologetic because she killed the big giant black man, 
she'll look a little bit more virtuous as opposed to if she was a brunette. Like nobody caught on to that. And then here comes old girl the bailiff. Yeah, girl, it's going to be all right. Here's a thing of tissue. I'm going to take care of you, my sister. You're going to be all right. No, she's going to jail. She killed somebody. You know, I understand empathy. I understand that anything could have happened. It, it, it's possible that somebody could walk to the wrong apartment and, and freak out. But then you're talking about all the steps that came afterwards. The fact that she didn't really do CPR. The fact that she didn't call for backup. You know, all of that is a problem. And then when you're talking about what was in her social media and all that racist stuff she's saying, stuff about Martin Luther King, whatever she said about Colin Kaepernick, all of that, oh no, we're not about to sit here and be the best friends kumbaya folks and you don't even like us like that. Like that's one of the things we'll do. We will sit here, you, you see it all the time. You see it with somebody like Van Jones does that crap where, oh, true story. I don't know how I ended up at this crap. One of my friends invited me um, to some event he had. This is right after Trump won. And um, there's this venue in D.C. called, I think it's Ninth and I or something. I can't remember. But Van Jones was there with um, some other person from CNN, one of them crazy people. And um, they were talking about just the, the, the heart of America. And Van Jones, mind you, this is a black man. Um, his entire perception was, you know, as black people, we need to just understand the plight of white Americans who were tired, who were tired of the economy, who were tired of struggling. You know, we got to look at, at it through all of their lenses, and then we'll understand why America is the way it is. And my response to that was, well, what about black folks? That's been our experience the whole time. So for me, you're telling me it's justified that, I don't know, Bartholomew, who lived in West Virginia, who lost her coal mine job because coal is going out, because, of course, everything's getting a little bit more, you know, as far as energy, it's more natural resources and everything else like that that are, you know, cleaner and all of that. So you've known that that's been the way for how long? But you chose to never go and, and, and figure out other options or, or get training on how to use some of the newer energies. And, or, you know, the state of West Virginia just chose not to invest in something like solar energy or wind energy or water energy or anything like that. They chose to stay dormant and, and stick with coal like it's 1955, like the Sputnik is coming across the sky. And then because those people are now lost and they don't have what it is that they're looking for and they're pissed off at the world and they think it's black folks fault and the Muslim fault and Latino people's fault and this people's fault and those folks fault and everything else. And they go and vote against their own interests and vote against the interests of everybody else just so they have the possibility of getting somebody in office who may give them a decent job. And so they get the decent job. Everybody else struggles. And, and that's OK. That's pretty much what Van Jones was pushing out. That you know, it's OK. We got to understand. We got we got to look and see through their eyes. I'm like, nobody ever looks through ours. So why are we doing that with everybody else? You know what I mean? Like it's some real trifling stuff. And so again, I think some of it is just, we're, we're already a nurturing group of people. We just know what it's like to be on the end that, you know, that receiving end of just detriment, that receiving end of just pain. However, we have to not be so naive. And we have to also recognize that we have to protect ourselves because nobody else has it in for us. And, and it's kind of the same argument with us going and, and hopping and dying on the hill for everybody else before we take care of ourselves. I saw an interesting argument on Twitter the other day. Um, what was that argument about? The argument, damn, what was it about? It was something real good, too. I wanted to jump in, but I, I didn't want to jump in arguments, so I was just watching. It had something to do with, God, I wish I could remember. Man, I was on a roll, too. But long story short, it, was, it had something to do with this whole people of color conversation. And everyone just has to kind of stick together, and we'll all make it. And I'm like, that doesn't work. It doesn't work when you have something like white supremacy in power. And we have different groups of people who do identify as people of color, depending on, on where they come from, but they've already drank the Kool-Aid of white supremacy. So if you have somebody who, perfect argument. I remember this person argued me down on YouTube one day. They were from Portugal. I had a video talking about race or something like that. They jump on my thing talking about, you know, well, as a person of color, I think you, you're, you have too much aggression towards white people. I'm like, no, it's not aggression towards white people. It's aggression towards the history that has been perpetuated and continues that white people don't challenge because they sit in the comfortability aspect of what they benefit from within that history. That's my argument. And so he goes, he says some line about, well, I'm a person of color and I understand and my people um, didn't own slaves and blah, blah, blah. You got to move on. And I'm like, time out. You're from Portugal. Your country alone took 5.8 million Africans and brought them to the United States. Your entire country's economy is based off slavery. 5.8 million people. So out of the 13 million that, that made it over to the Americas, whether it was Central or South of the United States, and, and you know those who didn't die on the way there, 5.8 million of them came from your country. Your country took almost more, close to half. And you got the nerve to sit up here and tell me, you know, well, it wasn't my folks. No. I'm like, how do you even think you got over here? You know, it, it's the wealth that was already accumulated for your country to have an infrastructure and for you to have opportunities to go and do whatever you want to do and then travel over here. 
And so one of the issues you have is you have people who do travel and, and come around from different aspects of the world. And yes, they are, I guess you could say, people of color, but they don't identify or see the world that way. And they don't align with black folks. A lot of people come to the United States to be white. And that's not even just from Europe. There's some people who come from the continent of Africa. I love, I love my brothers and sisters across the water, but there's some who come from back home across the water and they come to America to be white, not to recognize or align with the same people that they share the same skin with, which is why you're seeing such a cultural divide. And I'm saying that from a place of love, not criticism, just do better folks. And then you see it with people that come from the Caribbean as well. And then hell, there's black folks who do that. And so again, that whole aspect of, that forgiveness Olympics and being nurturing and taking care of everybody. And, you know, it's okay. You can kill my brother. I forgive you. I want to be your friend. And it's okay that you're only going to jail for 10 years. I know people, no, I'm not going there. I'm going to move on. Um, what you call it? Somebody's going off and cussing me out of my text message. That's okay. <laughs> but um, again, it's just, mm, that was triggering to watch. It killed me. I think the, of the three between the bailiff, the judge and the brother, I think what got under my skin the most was more so the judge. I wasn't really going to go in on the brother because one, he's already still grieving. And so I can't tell him how to grieve. How to grieve. I, I don't live in his head. I don't live in his world. He may see the world differently than I see it. And so if, if that's really how he wants to do things, kudos to him. Like he want, Even though I'm not going to lie, when um, he asked, could he hug her? And then the judge said, yes. I was like, ooh, they done messed up. I was like, he about to strangle her in front of these cameras. He about to break her neck or something. I just knew it was going to happen. But no, he really wanted to hug her. I was like, oh, okay. Cause I, cause listen, that's another thing. Let's just say he spazzed out, choked the girl out and everything. Now the judge would have been catching it. So again, when we go and we try to always protect and coddle everybody, stuff will still come to bite us in the behind. Because if that brother had spazzed out when he got to Amber and choked her out and, and you know, and then everything, and it would have been on national TV, all the cameras would have been replaying it and relooping it every day. It would have been a political conversation, everything that judge was going to be thrown out real quick. And mind you, from what I understand, when I was looking at the politics of that judge, She's kind of wishy-washy anyway, in my opinion, based on some of the people she supports. But of course, that blackness cloud would have fell right over her. She would have been black that day because they would have pushed her out of there real quick. They might have even got rid of the bailiff, too. She didn't move fast enough because she was so busy still brushing the girl hair. So there's that. Let me take a quick break, see what we're talking about, and then we're going to switch subjects here. Because um, y'all, I can't even get to all these comments. Y'all are over here typing in a million words a minute. Um, Okay, this is a good question. Somebody said, why is it considered to be shucking and jiving to forgive someone um, after over a year of grief? As Christians, that's what we're supposed to do regardless of race. It takes some longer than others. I fully understand and I empathize with, with that aspect. But the problem is, and I'm not going to say the problem is, but well, I guess I did say. But here's the thing. Again, when it comes to religion, the experience of religion amongst black people has always been different than everybody else. Because our experience has always been so punitive. And then sometimes I, I wish to God, I wish I could see the versions of the Bible that existed before King's, King James came and changed up some stuff. Because we already know Christianity, like one of the things I always try to correct people on is people always are quick to bring up Christianity and say, you know, it was taught to us to be slaves and everything. And, you know, Europeans created Christianity, but it started in Ethiopia. It started way before Columbus and all them. So there was already a version of Christianity that existed before Europeans came and turned it into what it is today. It always, I always wish I could see what would have been in that initial text. Because, of course, by the time King James got up in there, there were books that were thrown away. There were things that were altered. There were bits that were shifted and changed. And so I think that's why there's some bits in the Bible that are confusing. There's some bits in the Bible that you're like, huh? Wait a minute. Huh? And so going back to that question, that version of the Bible was kind of what was put on black folks. And it was so punitive. Even when you talk about the experience of being in the church during slavery, like when you talk about why you saw people, you see people go like this in church if they go to the bathroom, that comes from the fact that during that time period, within the black churches during slavery, they weren't allowed to just meet by themselves. There was still an overseer who was in there who had to monitor and keep count just in case anybody tried to sneak out or tip out and everything like that. So when people would walk out like this, this was saying, you know, I'm going to the bathroom, whatever, count me, I'm still in number because if the number was off by the time the service was over, okay, somebody might have escaped. All right, send out the dogs. We need to go and chill, chew some people up. Somebody's in one of these woods we're gonna have to kill. And so again, religion was taught to us and it was put on us from such a punitive standpoint. And the only thing that was not punitive in that religion were white people. That's how it was taught to us. Like, can we talk about the names? And I'm not trying to tackle anybody's religion. I want you to believe in whatever you believe in, whatever helps you sleep at night, whatever gives you your peace and your serenity. Because listen, I have my relationship with God. But again, you know, when you're just talking about even the names in the Bible, Sarah, John, these Peter, 
these were not even phonetically phonetically these would not be the kind of names that would have existed in the regions that th these people existed in during the time period so of course you've seen these names have been changed and so again and i'm not going to take anybody's religious you know believe what you want and if, if you feel like i'm taking down what you believe in it's okay if you got to turn it off i understand but again everything that was taught to black people as a collective when it comes to religion is so punitive and i see it as well with people from the continent um especially in west africa the same thing it was when, when the crusaders and all of them and everybody started going and colonizing the way that christianity was introduced especially to a place like the congo was so punitive you saw how they were chopping the people's hands off like and, and if you go to sweden and you see like the chocolate hands it's like a candy that's what it originates from when you talk about leopold who went to the congo and killed like 20 30 million people somebody they don't teach the kids in school because they want to spend all day talking about hitler which is just as terrible but i'm like okay hitler killed six million people leopold killed like four times as much so i think leopold needs some chapters in the history books as well but again I think, uh, like I said before, I wouldn't necessarily call it shucking and jiving, but I do think God gives us common sense. I do think that on this planet, you, you have your faith, you have what it is internally that gives you your peace, but God did give you common sense and, and gave you tools on this earth in order to navigate the earth and be, you know, have somewhat of a decent life before you go into the next life or whatever it is that you believe. And I think for us, sometimes we we jump so far into faith that sometimes we don't even pick up the pieces that are right before us like the perfect example has anybody ever watched um that show have and have nots um i think i talked about it a long time ago um there's a character on there hannah this is why i stopped watching the show because she got on my nerves um and it's not, now hannah was like the the older black woman who you know very religious she reminds me of like my mom back in the day like very religious loves the lord she's gonna like quotes scripture and everything like there was a scene where she's arguing with this other guy who's calling her all kind of b words and f that and, and i'll break your neck and all she's doing is like well peter so-and-so tells me and i'm like that doesn't work if the other person doesn't believe in god <laughs> you can't you know but the argument i want to make was in the story she has this son and the son gets hit by a car or something so he's on life support and so he's about to die like he's one step from death and then the son's real father happens to pop up and tries to come back into his life but the father really just wants the son to die because the father needs the kidney and so the father goes to the court and somehow the judge is ready to, you know, the judge orders, okay, we're going to kill the son. And then the father can get the kidney. And instead of Hannah, the mom, who's like, you know, this is, they just said, they're going to kill your son. Instead of her, like getting another lawyer and being ready to fight, what does she do? Oh Lord, please God. Oh, please God, 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 God. Oh God. I'm like, really? We can't be that damn soft, man. Come on now. Um, and, and, and again, and I, I hate the fact that sometimes People will harp on the vulnerabilities of people and pass that off as them being, you know, closer to Christ or closer to God. And I'm like, no, that's no, you, you're taking advantage of people. And like, so it, it, it just, mm. again, everybody, your, your walk is your walk. Whatever you believe in is what you believe in. But in that specific situation, when you see what happened in this case, you saw all the injustices. I'm pretty much if Amber's story didn't suck so bad, if Amber's alibi wasn't so horrible, if Amber just, you know, everything, she did everything wrong, like I said in the last video. If that wasn't the case and it was a little bit more pieced together, they would have had Botham Jean looking like the, uh, the criminal. They would have, but they couldn't because her story was that screwed up. And so I think, again, when it comes to us and, and the forgiveness and the love, you can do that. That's what we're supposed to do. That's how you sleep good at night. But at the same time, it's okay. Like, here's the thing. You can forgive somebody and not be their friend. You can forgive somebody and not invite them over to dinner. You can forgive somebody. You, you you use the lesson of forgiveness to make sure something like that doesn't happen again. But since the father wants to be friends and they want to go play spades once you get out, like, I don't know. Anyway, I don't mean to speak on religion like that. I usually try to stay away from, from religion because everybody has what they believe in. Um, anyway, let me go back to the comments. Um, mm, mm, mm. Um, hope I ain't pissing everybody off, but... Uh, Oh, I didn't even finish my point about people of color. But yes, that people of color thing as well, um, I'm not a fan of because the idea of people of color makes it seem like everybody else is less than except for white people. Because really, if you look at the world through that lens, it's white people and then people of color. It's white people, everybody else. And everybody else falls in the everybody else bucket. And we can, you know, if everybody actually did vouch for each other the way that black folks vouch for everybody else, as far as the whole people of color umbrella, then I can support that movement more, but you don't see it at all. The fact that every country around the world has a version of the N-word is a problem. Like, I got a problem with that. So, there we go. Anyway. 
somebody said the Portuguese are white, so what the F were they talking about? Listen, it's, I don't know. I, I didn't see what the person looked like. He just let me know he was a person of color because he came um, to, um, whatchamacallit, to the United States. It kind of reminds me of like one of my old employers. Like when I first started my, my current job, so I was 22 when I started, um, and I looked a little bit younger. And so my former boss was a Korean woman. And at the time, they used to get frustrated with me because one, like I said, I work with kids. So I, I wasn't, when I first went to the job, I was dressing up wearing like the slacks and the button downs and the ties and stuff. And then I, once I realized, okay, my center is a smaller center. I have a smaller staff. I have to be hands-on with the kids all the time. So I'm in there mixing paint and wiping noses and, and, and dodgeball and kickball. And we doing homework, we're doing arts and crafts and I got to do this and we got to do cooking club and all that. It made no sense to be dressed up and all this stuff. So I, so I started looking a little bit more casual. And so one day I had a meeting with my my boss because she called me and she's like the first thing she goes mind you she was Korean she's like as a woman of color I understand the experience of working in the workplace and how things can be racist and blah 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 you know but they want you to start wearing suits again because one you you look like you're already one of the kids because you're younger you look like you can pass for one of the teenagers we need you to look like you're the director of the center and we need you to do this and we need you to do that and in the back of my mind the whole time she's saying that I'm thinking of the fact I was like woman of color and because she was Korean I kept thinking of the fact that when I grew up one of my childhood friends, their mother owned a black owned beauty supply store, hair and beauty supply store. And I remember the hassles that the mother had to go through to get inventory because we've said this before in a few videos, but like the majority of, you know, the black hair owned, like the, not the black owned, but the beauty hair supply stores where you get, you know, all the products for your hair or skin and everything like that. Most of them are owned by Koreans. And it's to the point where now even the catalogs that they have to order the inventory from are written in Korean. So a lot of black owners who do own shops usually go out of business because they can't get any product in the store. I just saw an article about two young ladies. I think they were based out of California. They started, you know, their own black owned beauty supply store. And even though they were getting great business, they had to close because they couldn't get, you know, the, the people that own the actual warehouses where all the products would be. They would not sell to them because within the Korean community, they know they have a monopoly on that. They will not sell no ifs, ands, or buts. So then when you talk about that people of color conversation, I'm like, okay, well, wh where's the people of color unity? you know see that's what i'm talking about so it doesn't quite work because again that's us always being inviting because if you want to talk about the black hair industry the only reason that you have it being operated and owned by the asian community is because black people let them in after world war ii when the half of america was afraid of asians the only people who even gave them an opportunity to work in their neighborhoods were black folks even though this is also around the same time that you saw segregation ending so black folks were starting to expand out but you saw a lot of asian people living amongst black people Black people showed Asians how to do nails, how to do hair, and everything like that. Oh, yeah, I'll show you here. Let me show you how to do the wash and go. This is the wash and set. You got to do it like this. And you got to put this. Don't put the perm in with the bleach. You're going to, all the hair going to fall out. Do that together. This is how you do the nails. And before you know it, now they got the businesses. They got the monopolies. And they got it set. They got it on lock. And so now it's almost oppressive to take care of your own cosmetics because you're buying into that system. Um, and so that, that, there's that conversation about the people of color. I want to move on a little bit. Um, let me see here. Because I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, let's talk about old girl, the young lady um, with the locks. Which, dang, man. When I tell you this year, I've been 0 for 3 on reaction videos to some kind of situation that happened in regards to race. 0 for 3. One was Jesse. Jesse happened. And see, the other thing is y'all will cuss me out if I don't jump on a subject within like two days. If I wait like a week like I normally like to wait, y'all like, how come you ain't talking about this yet? You need to talk about this. This is going on. So I was like, okay. So I hopped on Jesse. We saw what happened. The Jesse situation is still a little confusing because I don't know what's going on with that. But the Jesse situation, I hopped on it. And then I had to look stupid like two days later. And then the Covington teens or whatever, them kids that was messing with the Native American people, even though I still think I'm right on everything I said, had to fall back on that one. I was like, dang. And now with this situation with the young lady, I purposely waited. I waited because I told you me and my friend were arguing about it. Um, and then I was like, oh, it's been a week. All right, I'm going to talk about it now. And I said my whole two cents, and I gave my spill about, you know, the experience of being black youth in America and how young black girls and young black boys can't even be themselves in school. And it's that and the third, and they got to be in hostile environments. And then, like, I uploaded the video. Literally, 12 hours later, <laughs> I was at work, and I got the little notification from my little NBC4 app, and it was like, um, the young lady who claimed that she was attacked by the so-and-so, she admits she lied. I was like, oh, my God. <sighs> And that wasn't even a video I was planning to post that day. I was definitely doing a totally different video. I was supposed to finish uploading my shout out series because I'm way behind on that. And that's supposed to come out next week. So I was like, dang. But anyway, in that situation, 
I do still think she was harassed at the school. And I think what happened was nobody was listening to her. And so she felt that she had to do something extreme in order to get the attention. That was kind of my perception. Somebody else was like, no, nah, she done messed up her hair or something. And the mom was about to cuss her out. So she made up that story. Um, I don't know. But again, the conversation would still stand as far as you being a student in a space like that. And, and if you want, well, the video is not up anymore. But in that video, I talked about the demographics of where the school is and the location. And when you're talking about the conversation of wealth versus class, and then you bring up the um, subject of race and the experience. So the school had about 405 kids, 14% um, of the school is black, 67% of the students that went to the school were on financial aid. So you already know that a lot of people in the school probably had the assumption that most of the kids who were from a different race other than white were probably on financial aid going to the school because it was a private school. The school's tuition was $10,900. Um, and so there's a bunch of conversations to be had. I, I, I just hate that some people feel that that's their only way to combat what's happening around the world. Because at the end of the day, all of those atrocities are already happening. We don't need people to go and make up things to try to you know, fuel the story because all that does is it chips away at what's really happening. It chips away at, at, at the progress that other groups of people who are, are actually making. Um, and, and, and again, she's 12, so it's... I don't think she even realized it was going to blow up to be that. I don't think she thought it was going to get to that point. Um, um, and you know what's going to happen now is like, they're going to kick that girl out of that school real quick. You know, so now the tables have turned. Now I was the main one talking about kicking boys out of the school. And y'all were going in on the comments too, for those who got to see the video. They're like, more, F that, it's more than just kicking them out of school. You know, this was almost literally rape. And this, that, and the third. And folks were chewing me out on that too. Like you were too soft on the kids. You need to really like, you know, Blah, 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 blah. Now I'm kind of glad I ain't said what I really thought because I would look crazy talking about, you know, this is what they need to do to some 12 year old kids and nothing even, they didn't even do what the crime was. But again, um, I can see them kicking a the girl out of school, unfortunately. And I don't think she would want to go anywhere. And I don't think the parents would want her to go because she'd be a target for real now. And even if the things did happen, I still think nothing was really going to happen to the boys because most likely their parents probably donate to the school. Like you see that a lot of times too with these rich academies and everything like that. If the parents are donating, the kids, their kids can get away with a little bit more. Um, it's just the way things are. Hot mess. Let me see what y'all are saying here. Mm. I didn't take the little string out of my teeth. My kids bought me this mug. Has a little M on it. Um, huh. Let's see. Where are we at, folks? I haven't even got to see most of these comments, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I don't get to your comment because, um, man. Mm, mm, mm. I'm kind of just scrolling a little bit, so give me one second. Um, Y'all in here arguing? Who is this? Okay, okay. In the 1600s, there were slaves in Europe. They were not on the throne. Do your research if you want to act pro-black. What are you talking about? We know that there's slaves in Europe, but I need you to you're gonna have to put that in context. I don't get what you're trying to go with. I don't know what you're responding to, but okay, Sunfire. Fire. Uh, let's see. Um, yes, thank you, girl interrupted. Somebody said, Calvin, you're not a drama channel. Feel free to wait to make your responses. See, that's what I like to do. That's why my videos don't be coming out the day when something goes down. I like to wait, honestly. Um, because that's how you get caught up anyway. Because then you jump into something and then your facts don't even be right. Um somebody said, Aren't there some Africans who have natural hair care lines in the US? Yes, there are. But the problem is, unfortunately. A lot of times we're not even buying some of those products. Like, and, and I think because we also get fooled. So people go into the stores and they see something like dark and lovely and they think it's a black owned hair product because there's a black model on there and it's a Korean company. Um, and so that's kind of the issue. And one of the things that happened with my friend who used to have, well, her mom used to have the supply store. I think they have one. It's in Fort Worth, Texas now. I think it's called Valentino's, but they used to have one in, in like Tacoma, Washington as well. Um, it was so hard for her to get business because of course, with the Asian stores that were so huge, um, you know, nobody would go to the mom and pop supply store that was a fifth of the size of the big giant Asian one. And so what people would do is this, they would go to the Asian store and get all the stuff and get the wigs and everything. But my friend's mom's store, they had it set up where they had different booths and rooms where you could try on the little wig things and, and get it tested and they could clip it and cut it. And so they go buy the stuff at the other store and then go to my friend's store to get the service. I was like, dang, that's trifling, ain't it? Um, anyway. Um, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Yeah, the school was in Springfield, Virginia. Yeah, uh-huh. Now my mama want to call me while I'm doing the video. I'll call her back. All right. All right, we're going to move on. 
Let's see. 17 year old sentenced to life to prison for stealing a Lamborghini. That I feel, is that the same kid that was in Dallas? I'm trying to remember. Um, goodness. Okay, let's move to the next subject. Somebody wanted to act, talk about Stacy Dash. She's only getting like five minutes of my attention because she's somebody I don't have the energy for. Um, what I found interesting is that Stacy Dash has no money. That's what threw me off. She didn't even have enough money to pay for a lawyer. She had to get the public defender. And I'm like, oh, so you don't went, you did all that cooning for the last, what, since about 2011, 2012? You've done all that cooning and throwing the black community under bus, under the bus all day and black men need to do this and black women aren't doing this and this happened and so on on and so on and you on Fox News just eating up all of that foolishness they were throwing out there and you don't even have enough money to pay for your judging or, or, or your lawyer? I'm like, no disrespect to Diamond and Silk, but at least they get to keep the apartment they in. I do wish the Diamond and Silk, at some point, they got to give them two ladies two new wigs or something because they've been loyal to them two wigs since 2015. Every time I see them doing the stumping for Trump stuff, they got them same two wigs on. At least switch them. Put them on. Y'all take, you take those off and give it to the other girl and trade it. Do something. But um, listen, if you're going to sit here and do all the cooning, I thought you, it should pay off. If you're going to sell out your community, at least get a check for it. You, you broke and don't even have it. And then, you know, they put her down as white. And, and the ethnicity box, I said, okay, she might actually really, something might just actually be wrong with her internally. Um, mm, okay, let me see. Oh, okay, thank you, Sunfire, for cleaning that up. I didn't know what you were talking about. Thank you for clearing that up. All right, uh, let's see. Stacey Dash, but no, Stacey Dash, I, I do think something is mentally off with her. And I want to say, I feel like, this might sound crazy, but I feel like she's been bleaching because I remember her being darker as a child. A lot darker. She just looks very interesting to me now. Um, I don't know. Something's off. Anyway, moving on. Let's see. Um, I did want to talk about Byron Allen's case. I want to actually do a separate video on it, but I'll talk about it here. So for those who don't know, there's a really big case that's about to go down on November 13th. I'm not the best person to give all the insight on it because I'm still doing my own research. But I will say the YouTube channel Tone Talks, he does a really great job of, of expounding on everything that's going on with the case. But Byron Allen is pretty much a media mogul who super rich too. He has all kinds of networks and channels, but pretty much he's suing Comcast um, because Comcast refuses to pretty much, you know, air or, or let his, um, the networks that he owns, because he owns like eight or nine additional networks. He owns like, he owns the Weather Channel. He owns, there's like, did I write it in my phone? Uh, let me see if I wrote it down. He has a bunch of different channels and networks that he owns that are like, um, and they're all black owned. Mind you, he is a 100% owner of his company which is rare to find in media. I'm scrolling my phone, Trump. Uh, damn, did I write it down? Come on, I hope I have it in here. Uh, I was so busy reading my little book on Audible earlier. Uh, do I have it? Do I have it? Do I have it? Do I have it? Okay, so he has a bunch of ch channels. So one is called like Comedy TV, um, Pets TV, Recipe TV. Um, there's a network or a show called The Young Icons. He has a show, a channel called Local Now. He has a weather channel, Espanol, if you want to speak it in Spanish, everything like that. But pretty much Comcast is not, you know, they're refu refusing to add his networks into their system. And so the basis of his suit, because this is a $20 billion lawsuit, the basis of his suit is coming from the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And there's a section in there called, there's a, there's a section 1981 of that amendment that pretty much states, and this is, a, this is a law coming out of the Reconstruction era, where the idea was pretty much in order to make whole Black Americans who had just come out of slavery, they have to be able to have the, the right to do contracts with anybody. And they can't be denied contracts because of their race or, or, or anything like that or, or their lineage. And, and that's both for the state and for private entities. And so pretty much he's saying that because Comcast, re, like, well, 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 one, Comcast already has a monopoly on the cable system anyway. Comcast and, and, and Verizon or, or uh, Files, whatever you want to call it, they pretty much already have monopolies on everything. Um, and so his argument is, I have all these networks you're refusing to even like let mine come into your system. Mind you, y'all got 150,000 sports channels. You got 150,000 channels of this. Like if you ever think about the kind of packages that they offer for something like Comcast, you can almost get a thousand channels. And he's saying the fact that, you know, again, if black people are making up 13% of the population, but when you're talking about the number of black owned networks on your service and, you know, on your system, you're already not meeting that quota. The quota already doesn't exist because there's not enough of black channels that are there. But then the ones that are there, you're not even allowing people to subscribe to through your service. And so that's pretty much the suit. It's going to go to trial on November 13th. Um, the reason this is a big deal is because if the Supreme Court decides to vote in favor of Comcast, that pretty much means that any company from this point on 
if they want to discriminate against doing business with somebody who, because they're black, they can do that. Literally, they literally can do that. So when it's when you're talking about contracting, when you're talking about big giant company mergers, when you're talking about all of that, it pretty much means that you know if they vote in favor of Comcast. Most people don't have a leg to stand on because pretty much they're going against what's in that constitutional statement from 1866. Now, if they do vote in favor of Byron Allen, that means, you know, they're going to have to either give some compensation or they're going to have to allow his networks to stream on Comcast. And I'm sure Verizon would be next up. And so that would be an interesting one. Um, but again, that's going to be a really huge case. It's interesting that you're not hearing about it at all in the media. Like, I don't think I've ever seen it on the news. I, and maybe because Comcast carries all the channels, but um I have never he heard or seen that case on anything. I read it. The reason I found out about it is some of the subscribers on this channel started saying, hey, have you heard about this? Have you heard about this? And then, you know, I started, you know, some of the old news publications I read that are independent. And I, that's where it started popping up. I was like, okay, um, let's see. I'm trying to scroll around here. Somebody asked me, J-Lo in the Super Bowl. I'm not pressed about. I haven't watched the Super Bowl since 2015 anyway. Um, listen. Y'all were cussing me out, saying I was hating on Jay-Z because he was trying to do stuff for the community and he was going to be the one and it was going to be the, the woke Super Bowl this year. And that's what he gave. Well, I don't even think he had anything to do with that, to be honest. I think they already had that mapped out. And so as far as j Lo and Shakira, um, I'm sure it'll be a great show. Um, it is what it is. I'm not going to be watching, though. So there's that. I don't really have much to say on it. Um, but, yeah, we'll, we'll see what's going on with um, Inspire Change since y'all was cussing me out about that one. But I haven't seen the change be inspired. Um, moving on. And then somebody did ask me, um, Remy Ma's statements in regards to rape. I, I'm not gonna spend too much time on that either. I don't even know where that came from, but pretty much she said some mess about, um, how did she say it? I, it, it had, it, it was something along the lines of if a victim was raped and money was exchanged and they're a prostitute or, or something crazy, something out of pocket. Uh, again, this just goes back to you. You. This is why you got to stop having celebrities speak on certain topics. If they're not well versed in it, let them not speak on it. Don't look to celebrities to be the answer for everything. Every time we have, just like I said with the revolt summit, you know, every time we have, you know, some kind of summit in regards to blackness in America, do you really have to have all of the favorite rappers on there or your favorite actor, your favorite actress? If, if like Regina Hall is one of my favorite women in the world, I absolutely love her. If I could marry her, I would. If I, if I was 10 years older, I would go after her. If I had, if I had to pull to get Regina Hall, I just think she has the most hilarious personality on top of the fact that she's gorgeous. She would just be my ideal wife. However, if they were having a panel on, I don't know, reparations or the wealth gap or the prison industrial complex, I don't expect to see her sitting there. I don't care how pretty she is. What's she doing there? Like if that's not the conversation where she hasn't done the research on it, I don't need her giving me insight. I know she would make some, some great jokes and stuff, but that wouldn't be the time to joke. You know what I mean? So again, with Remy Ma, listen, I don't know. She, she spent all that time in jail anyway, so I don't know if she got to go to the library while she was in the cell or not, but clearly she hadn't been doing a lot of reading. Anyway, moving on. Um, we did want to talk about some of the books. So let me shift gears here. I'm going to go bring a few over and then I'm going to just um, recommend some because a lot of you guys have been asking me about the books and I feel bad because every night... I get some comment, you know, because I, I, I've gotten a lot of subscribers lately, but I'll get a comment. It's like, hey, can you talk about the books? 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 And I'm like, I did. I did. I'm like, your questions, my answers video. I did it in like eight videos, but we'll do it again. It's a, again, you don't want to be a gatekeeper to information and act like you can't share it with anybody. So I'll be right back. All right. What am I grabbing first? Oh, um, oh. All right, I'm going to do a few of these at a time. So first order of business, folks, this one here is an interesting one. It's called, I'm going to try to make sure I have my camera's in here. It's called Innocence Lost. And in this one, this is um, pretty much this writer has gone all around the world and he follows child soldiers. And this is about pretty much children who are forced to fight on behalf of their country. And there's some really interesting stories. It's actually kind of a sad read, but it's interesting to kind of um, showcase pretty much just the experience of what it's like, depending on where you live in the world. You know, in America, you get the you get the luxury, depending on your socioeconomic status and depending on the upbringing that you get, you get the luxury of being a child. You get the luxury to go play. You get the luxury uh, of, of having friends and riding bikes or doing whatever it is that you do as a child. In this book, you meet, there's like, there's one story, I think it's coming out of Sudan where this young lady, um, they killed everybody in her village. 
And then she ended up being like a concubine where they pretty much took and raped her and raped her and raped her and raped her. And she had to serve um, some other kind of soldiers or something. There was another story about a kid. Um, this was during the Rwanda situation. And he ended up having to kill his own family. I was like, this is crazy. There's another story coming out of Liberia. You know, Liberia had the Civil War. And, well, they had a few Civil Wars. But the, the most recent one was in like 2000 or towards the, end of, the very beginning of the 2000s. But it was talking about just child soldiers and how a lot of them were given cocaine and codeine. So they would be able to kind of mentally block out what they had to do to other people. Cause they were like, literally like when you're talking about the Liberian civil war, it was literally the people fighting against each other because of corrupt governments. And so, you know, the boys were all recruited to go. And if some of them were like forced to do things like rape their own mother, which is kind of crazy. So they gave the kids cocaine and everything like that. So that they, and they wouldn't even feed the kids either. So they would be hungry and they'd be living off cocaine and codeine and other drugs and that was the only way you could mentally get them to go and do the atrocities that they had to do and it's so sad because today you know those child soldiers would now be adults who would probably be about my age so late 20s and early 30s who have ha had all of these traumatic experience traumatic experiences and never got the opportunity to get the therapy or anything else to kind of make them whole so you have an entire generation of kids who were lost they're adults now but to me they're they're, they're still children which kind of goes back to the title of innocence lost so that's an interesting book. Um, this book is by um, Jimmy Briggs. Again, so this one is called Innocence Lost. So next book, um, I actually know this person. This is from Dr. Leonard Pitts. This is actually um, literature. Now, this book is called um, Freeman. This book, I'm trying to make sure you guys can see it. So in this book, this takes place right after slavery ends. And so the individual, he's in Philadelphia. He's free. He's living his best life. However, he misses his wife. Because, of course, you know, with slavery, folks got sold off and shipped to this plantation and that plantation. And so... He leaves Philadelphia and he goes on a quest to find his wife. It's a really great, it's like a, like, kind of like a love story, um, even though it's a very oppressive story, but it's kind of like a nicer version of 12 Years a Slave, only I want to say this came out way before the movie. Um, and I think there was a book of 12 Years a Slave, I can't remember, but anyway. Next one. Um, this one here is an interesting one too. This is American Nightmare. This one's about Jim Crow. And so it just talks about, and this is by um, Gerald M. Patrick. I'm trying to make sure you guys can see it. And so this one, Boy, you want to talk about how screwed up America is? I wish I had that page. I think I had it on page 190. Uh, there's a part in here. Let me see if I still have it. I was like, hey, it's trifling in here. It was something about Mississippi. Uh, was it on that page? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Dang. Uh, I'll find it later because it's for the sake of time. I don't want to see it and keep digging and looking. But this is a good read. And so it talks about a bunch of different things. Everything from... Pretty much from life after reconstruction through sharecropping through almost the 1970s and so there's a bunch of different things they talk about plessy versus ferguson which is an interesting court case they talk about um i haven't this i read this one years ago so i'm trying to remember um uh, damn man i wish i wrote down um dang i'll find it later but okay this is a book here um and then this also when they start talking about the lynching ooh. That's why that whole nurturing aspect, I'm like, man, sometimes I have to take a break from some of these books because you'll read all this and then you'll be pissed. You'll be pissed off all week. <laughs> you go to work and then like <laughs> somebody will send you like a nice email like, good morning. Did you have those files for me? I said I'd do it tomorrow. <laughs> like, <laughs> Anyway, um, this one, this is kind of more so for like entertainment leader. This is when Janet came out with her book. This one's True You. True You. It's just kind of like a self-esteem type book. She talks about her experiences with weight gain. Um, it's not really an auto buy it autobiography kind of it's more so just her experience with her image um it's interesting though because like when you look at hey today i see tana may on here don't worry i see you making the eyes i'm gonna, I'm gonna shout your book out my friend today is on here that's the one from the podcast um but in the book like if you remember like the janitor that's like the that's the way love goes if anytime any place she had an eating disorder during that time period like and so even though she had like this really great body and everything she wasn't even eating and then um so she was just really like down on herself so that's an interesting book um the New Jim Crow. I think most of you know this book already. This is Michelle Alexander. Michelle Alexander. This is pretty much just talking about the incarceration system, how it screwed up, and how pretty much this is the new version of slavery as far as incarcerations. It talks about inequalities. It talks about the percentages of who's in jail based on how they look, how black people are, are tried more often than white people for the same crime, how we're convicted more often than white people for the same crime, how we spend longer time in, you know, times in prison for the same crime as white people. And so that's an interesting book. This one I actually have when I was in college. It's called Revelations. 
um, Teresa M. Red. It's pretty much a collection of essays by a bunch of black writers. There's some really great work by James Baldwin in here. Some really great one. There's one he has. I can't remember what it's called, but it's about black language. And I, I guess the argument at the time was about, oh, here it goes. I got, hi, I had the page been, I was ready. Um, it says, if black English isn't a language, then tell me what is. And so he goes on. This is actually a really good read. Maybe we'll talk about this a different day, um, just because I got like 25 more books to get through. But this is a good read here. But there's a bunch of different essays in it. We had to read this in one of my English lit, lit classes. Um, there's a great piece in here by Brent Staples as well, talking about black music. There's a great one by Bell Hooks talking about hair, like strengthening our hair. Not literally strengthening it, but literally just the conversations around it. Um, and then this was actually one of my favorite books. This is actually more of a, like a collector's copy. I got it autographed by the author. Um, Alan Light. This is History of Hip Hop by Magazine. Now, this came out, I want to say, 2004, 2005, 2006. So I would love to see an updated version. But pretty much in this book, it goes through the history of hip hop. It goes through every era up until about 2001, 2002. So it's MC Light. It's MC Trouble. It's, you know, it's Grandmaster Cass, Grandmaster Flash, Curtis Blow, Christmas Rapping. Um, the Wrecking Crew, like it's all of that. This is a great book. I get, I usually give this to my teams. I'll sometimes gift this and give this to them because you know all half of my teams want to be rappers. So um, I will gift this to them. Um, LL Cool J's in here, of course. Ice T, Ice Cube. Um, they talk about the '70s funk era and kind of how the Parliament in the funk delves and everything kind of segue segue into the early sounds of hip hop. KRS One, uh, all the Native Tongues, that whole crew. So like De La Soul, Tribe Called Quest. Queen Latifah, Moni Love, all of them. All right, let me go get the next set of books. Uh, I'll take this set real quick. Pow. All right, let's put this one back. Got to put it just how I found it. Okay, jeez Louise, I look kind of buff today. All right, chest. Okay, anyway, um, here we go. So the first one, I have to gas this one up because this is my best friend. So if you follow my podcast, you know I, um, what's my, you should listen. Oh, you know, I did do that, um, but I didn't do it on all, maybe I'll just do it on all the videos. Somebody was saying I should list the books in my video descriptions. I should. I used to do that on like two or three videos, but I got tired of trying to list it all because the list it's it's so long, so I had to like find a different way. Anyway, my best friend, Tana Mae Bullock, I call it her names today, but I call her Tana Mae like anime when she sings. And I used to be like Mike Turner instead of Ike Turner. We I wasn't hitting her though. So um she just recently released her own children's book. All right. She says this is her labor of love. It's called Son, You Are King. You are a king. And then also the illustrator is also a Howard University student. Her name, um, Jasmine Hatcher. And so this literally just came out. You can get this on Amazon, and so pretty much. It's a book that kind of just goes into the stereotypes and the limitations that we place on black youth. She's also coming out with another version, I believe, for young ladies as well. But it, and look, look, look how nice the pictures are. Okay, this is some effort. Because I'm going to tell you, when I was a child, and used to have these little kids' books, and there were never any kids, any books for black children. Look, look at the haircut. Look at that. Look at the haircut. He got the line up. Look at the details. Look look at the girls. In it. They all got the ni nice hair. Got a, look, this girl right here got a whole puff. When the last time you seen a puff in a children's book? All right? So... This is just talking about the discrepancies that children run through in school. And so pretty much it's like an assurance book or kind of like an affirmation. Um, you know, you are king. So every time, like an example, some, one says like, my teachers aren't always kind to me. Pick your head up, son. You're a king. And so this is definitely for little kids. And then look at the teacher. Mm. You want to talk about demographics of that teacher? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a conversation to be said. But anyway, um, so yes, you guys should definitely get this book. Look, she put a picture up. Actually, I ain't going to put your picture out know, for, for everybody to see Tanime. You're going to cuss me out. But her picture's in the book, too, if you want to see. Um, so yes, this is her labor of love. She has a bunch of other things coming out as well. She also does public speaking. So if y'all need somebody to speak to your youth or whatever, she does all of that kind of empowerment workshops. That's her thing. Anyway, moving on. I'll shout that out again in my actual shout-out series. This is one of my favorite, 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 favorite books. This is Asada Shakur's book. I think everybody in their right mind should read this book at some point. It's such a great story. It's, it's, it's not even like a story because it's real life. But she was framed by the state of New Jersey for killing a police officer. And so they put her on trial. Um, and I mean, when you 
find out the experience that she had in jail. Like, cause she ended up getting pregnant while she was in jail. Don't ask how, just long story short. She had the baby on the floor. Like they didn't even give her proper medical care, anything like that. All right. Horrible experience. And then, you know, she made it to Cuba. She, she broke out, but this is a great book. It talks about her child. Like it, the way that it's written is she has flashbacks to her childhood. And then she talks about what's going on with the trial. And I mean, there was so much corruption. They shot her. They didn't even take it to the hospital. Like she got shot. She was paralyzed in one arm. They didn't even do any corrective surgery or anything. She went through it in this book. So that's an interesting read. Um, I have not got a chance to finish Elaine Brown's book, but this is a taste of power. Elaine Brown, if you recognize her, you would recognize her from the Black Nationalist Movement. And so I haven't even got a chance to really get into this book like I would like to. Um, but yes, this is definitely a recommendation from what everybody's been telling me. So there's that one. Um, this is a fun one. How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And it's so interesting because now you're seeing it again, but this time it's not Europe, it's China. And so this is just talking about pretty much the scramble for Africa, Berlin Conference of 1884, how they go and they take, you know, all the European countries get a piece of Africa and then they start taking the cobalt and the gold and the diamonds and the oil and like chromium or whatever, it, it, everything, take it all. And so that's pretty much that's what that's about. And in addition to the fact that they colonized the continent and took all the resources, they limited what the people were able to do so the people could not build themselves up and they had to become dependent upon Europe in order to survive. So they talk about that. This is another interesting one. Somebody tried to fight me on Twitter over this. Um, this is Germany's Black Holocaust. They never talk about the black people who were killed during the Holocaust, but there were 80,000 who were killed. And so that's what this book is about. This is by, um, hold on, I forgot to get the author's name for the last book. One second. Um, this is, that just says Rodney. Oh, Walter Rodney is for the How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Um, and so for this one, again, this is Purple W. Carr when you're talking about the Black Holocaust. And it's a very interesting read. Um, and it's not just with Hitler. It's just talking about, um, I think it goes into detail again. We talk about Leopold. It talks about some other things. But um, I want to say when they talk about the peace with Leopold, it's not, it's still, this is still centered and focused on Germany. But they just referenced Leopold's segue into how something like what happened in Germany could happen. Um, and so it's interesting. They got pictures and stuff. Um, and then they even talk about like blackface and just the images that were portrayed. And like stuff like this is what helped the citizens to buy into the idea of it being okay that these things could happen to black folks across the world. Uh, this was my very first book I ever bought as a kid. I bought this in ninth grade. It's called Breaking In. This is still a good book. All right. This is pretty much for, it's called how um, 20 film directors got their start. And I enjoyed this because at the time, Brett Ratner was my favorite movie director. And so he has his experience in here about how he got into doing film because he first started out doing music videos. So he did like some heavy D music videos. Brett Ratner is the film director that did Rush Hour and films like Money Talks. And, and when I was in ninth grade, Chris Tucker was my favorite person in the world. That's who I thought I was going to be growing up. So this was actually the very first book I bought. I've just always kept it with me. I don't even know if you can still get this book anymore, but um, interesting book. It has um, who else is on here? Um, Kim Pierce, um, the director that did Men in Black, uh, Barry Sunnefield, um, Kings of New York, Abel Ferreira. So that's an interesting read. Let's do two more, and then I want to go on a few more subjects, and then I'll go back to some more books. We talked about this one before, uh, Michael Jackson, The Magic, The Madness, The Whole Story. I just, this one is from John Branca, which was like one of Michael's lawyers or something back in the day. So he wrote a book about just the entire experience of working with Michael, and it's an interesting book. Some of it, I don't know if all of the scrap in here is true, but there's some, there's an interesting read. Like, after you read something like this, you'd understand why Michael Jackson is the, or was the way he was. Really great book. What I like about the book is that it's numbers based. So they they take you on a journey from everything, from every Jackson 5 album to what the album did on the charts, how much it sold, what like I, I'm into numbers. I love numbers. So that's what this covers. Um, and, and it goes up into, I want to say it go, this edition, I think this goes even into the trial, I believe, because um, there's two or three versions of this book. I think this one goes into the trial. Um, last one, How America Was Lost. All right. This is about police brutality and the whole idea of pretty much turning, you know, the place into a military state. This is by Paul Craig Roberts. And pretty much this is, it, it just stems and talks about the idea of po not population control, but managing groups of people when they are irate about things that happen. So it addresses things like the LA riots or the Watts riots. It talks about how we were able to pretty much stoke the fear in Americans after something like 9-11 or something like the USS was it USS Cole bombing that happened right before 9-11? Uh, and just all of those different things and how if you can get people to be afraid of the unknown or afraid of people from around the world, you can get them to buy into military tactics. You can get them to buy into having a larger police force. You can get them to buy in 
to, you know, having National Guard troops and stuff all over the place or having, you know, um, air marshals and people that becoming the norm. And so it's just talking about how we're like a militarized state now. All right. Um, I'm going to put these back and we're going to do a few more topics and then I will close out on the books because, listen, I got to get up early tomorrow so we can't be up all night tonight. Uh, let me see. What else are we talking? I haven't got a chance to really look at the comments, so let me actually have some conversations with you folks. Um, let's see. I'll get to a few more books in a little bit, though. Um, somebody said not watching the Super Bowl. Yeah, I don't plan to watch. I, I might look at the, the, the performance on somebody's bootleg YouTube channel after the fact. I don't want them getting my views. Um, let's see. My Twitter is the same as my Instagram. It's give me a beat. Like G I M M I E A B A T. Um, who asked that? That was I forgot who asked. Somebody just asked. That. I just scrolled. Oh, Hyperballad. That's you. Um, boom, 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 boom. Um, somebody said I saw a documentary about child soldiers in Africa. It was awful what they did to people under the influence of dope. Yeah, that that mess is crazy. That's why, like, well, I always tell the kids I work with, like, y'all got to be grateful of the experience that you have. Even though sometimes you get the short end of the stick, it could always be so much worse. Like, I can't imagine having that kind of upbringing where you're forced to go and kill somebody or you're forced to kill your own family members. Um, like, one of my good friends who lives here now, they escaped the Liberian Civil War, and that was their experience. They were trying to recruit her brother, and um, I think the father, well, the father's still there. But, yeah, so she hasn't seen her dad since 2001. So that's some people's reality. Um, do you know about the colors drama on basketball wise? I'm sorry, I've never watched that show. Um, I don't, I wouldn't know who's who. Um, yeah, most of those VH1 shows I don't watch. Don't like to be honest, I don't get the chance to watch a lot of TV like I would like to. The only shows I really get to watch right now, I watch Power. Um, I kind of like Greenleaf, I like that show, and Power Greenleaf, This Is Us. Those are like the only three shows I will kind of follow. Um, because I don't have a lot of time to watch a lot of TV like I'd like to. But most of those VH1 shows I was never into. So like Basketball Wives or what else is on VH1? I love and Hip Hop. Um, I don't really watch those. So it's not really my cup of tea. So I wouldn't know what was going on. But if you're talking about a colorism argument, that sounds like something that would be on that show. That sounds about right. Um, Calvin, you haven't talked about what happened to the NFL, Antonio Brown. I, it's because I don't follow the NFL. I am so checked out from the NFL. I've been checked out since ever. Look, after. By the time Jerry Jones got to the toes to the line bit with the national anthem, and then you saw the Colin Kaepernick stuff and all that, and so on, and just how the NBC, I was about to say NBC, how the NFL responded to a lot of stuff around that time is when I checked out from the NFL. Um, but with Antonio Brown, I, I, I did see that he pretty much is no longer playing. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I wouldn't know what to say on it. Um, yeah, I don't have enough details. I have to look it up. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, let me keep scrolling. I'm halfway through the comments, guys. Sorry for those who are posting right now. I'm not to the bottom yet. I'm kind of scrolling a little bit. Sorry if I didn't get to respond to your comment. Just post it again. I'll probably see it at the bottom. Um, by the way, speaking of Tribe Called Quest, um, Q-Tip was at this, there was a De La Soul concert at Kennedy Center two or three weeks ago. Me and a good friend went. Really fun show, but Q-Tip was there, so that was kind of cool. Um, yes, the Sun You Are a King book is on Amazon. Yes, it is. Um, let me keep scrolling. Okay, let me get to the bottom. So if I missed your comment, I am so sorry because I've been running my mouth the whole time. I didn't get a chance to look at everybody's like I normally do. Any thoughts on the new show Mixed Dish? I haven't watched that either. I, I'm i in a great space with that because for me, people don't agree, but in my opinion, it's kind of like, I, I feel like a lot of times, depending on how you look, the mixed experience means you still fall into the black experience. Like somebody like a Halle Berry, in my opinion, I think was always going to be treated like a black woman as opposed to, I don't know. I don't know if Lisa Bonet is biracial or who's another example uh, or, or maybe Alicia Keys. I, I guess somebody like Alicia Keys may have had a different upbringing or a different experience than somebody like Holly Berry, even though they both had white mothers. I don't know how society treated them, but like, I just, I don't like the idea of a show mixes because I don't like them categorizing us and putting us into a bunch of different boxes. I haven't seen the show. Y'all can tell me if it's good or not. It just, it, it seems like it's, because I feel like the black experience has so many layers and so many levels. And so if they wanted to tackle the mixed experience, it should have just been incorporated into black. But I don't want to take that experience away from those who are biracial if they feel that they're not getting the representation. So me coming from the experience of being black and not mixed, or at least mixed on paper, um, I don't want to take that away from somebody else's experience. So if that's what people feel that they need and that's the representation they want, go for it. But I feel like with Hollywood, 
Hollywood already has a, a history of pretty much, you know, there's certain people who kind of get to be put on a pedestal and they get put into a lot of roles sometimes that sometimes should be designated for other people. That's another conversation, but I don't want to stir the pot and divide us because I think we're already up against enough. So in my opinion, I kind of, I've always placed, I, I don't really like to use the word mixed. To me, if you're mixed, you're black. That's how I see it. Um, unless you are kind of somebody who goes against the grain of what is progressive or productive for the black collective. Then, then I'm like, okay, you're going back to the other side then. That's how I see things. All right. Um, let me see here. Somebody said DC has all the good concerts. Yes, that's that's probably why I'm still living here. I love DC. DC has some great um, comments. Somebody asked me, what are your thoughts about the VA student that came out that a lot? I talked about it a little bit earlier. So after this live episode ends and it posts to the YouTube, just scroll into the, um, you know, scroll around and find it. It'll be, it'll be in there. Any thoughts on the Latino community using the N-word? I'm not down with that crap at all. It's different if you're Afro-Latino at least, but you know, you see that all the time. Them Salvadorian kids, boy, they love the N-word. Them ones in my neighborhood, or my old neighborhood, I'm like, yo, y'all see that crap more than me. What kind of mess? And it's almost a generational thing, too, because I've noticed with Generation Z, which are now the Zennials, because, you know, I'm a millennial. I was, I was born between 82 and 96. Um, the Zennials, or the Generation Z, they seem to be, and I'm not trying to categorize and put them all in the same box, but it does seem that within that generation, they're a little bit more relaxed in regards to a lot of things in regards to race. Like, they let a lot of stuff slide. I'm like, uh, my generation did it as well, but this generation up and coming, it's kind of like, I don't know, they just see things differently. Um, but I'm not down with that. Um, scrolling, 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 scrolling. Somebody said your album should be on the charts. I know it should, so go buy it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, we'll talk about my album on a different video, but yeah, it's out though, for those who don't know. I do music. I have two albums on Spotify and Apple Music and all the digital um, music outlets. One is called The Hardcover. That's the one that just came out, and the other is called Symphonic Euphoria. So, you got a chance definitely check them out it's all self-produced it's me doing everything on it all right let's see um hold on what is this this is a good question somebody asked me do you have an ncr law in the usa not criminally responsible very scary the man who decapitated another man is walking free here in canada because of the ncr law now that you have to explain to me what the ncr law is there probably is something but it might have a different name i'm not sure what it is what you what you're relaying to um boom 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 Oh, I have not got to um, Ted Hanks Cole's new book, um, The Water Dancer, because I remember you posted that. I don't have it yet. Um, if I do get it, it's probably going to be in my Audible. So uh, speaking of Audible, um, let me tell you what I, I do have in here as well to shout out that you should read. I've already talked about The Color of Law. If you want to get a better understanding of redlining, because I always mention redlining all the time on this channel, The Color of Law, that's that book. It is by... Um, Richard Rothstein or Rothstein, he does such a good job of digging up those ordinances and those and, and those um, just all the laws and everything they had in place that pretty much drew the lines in the maps of the United States of where people would be allowed to live. When we talk about redlining, redlining was just that system that prevented blacks from living in certain areas. And, and that's why all the cities are laid out the way they are. Um, that's a great read. Um, what else was in here that I got? I liked um, when affirmative action was white is a great one. Ira Katz Nelson. Um, Between the World and Me, I had that 10 AC Coast book. I like that book as well. That's a good one. Um, Defining Moments in Black History by Dick Gregory is a good one. Um, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. All right, let me get back to you guys. Um, what do we call the generation after Zennials? I have no idea. I don't know if they got a name for them yet. Um, do I like Brandy's new song, Freedom Rings? I like the vocals on it. The song I like more is there was like that same day that that song came out. There was another song that she was kind of in the studio playing to, or they were playing it. I like whatever that, that song was. Um, let's see. Boom, boom, boom. Wander, I want you to produce a 90s style R&B album for me with a modern sound. I want to go diamond. Look, I want to go diamond too, man. We'll, we'll, we'll chat. Um, let's see. Let's do a few more books and then um, we'll start rapping because I don't want to hold y'all all night. This will be our last round, and then during the next live, we'll go over some more of these, because we'll be here till midnight trying to go through all these books. 
And mind you, the books that are on the bookshelf or on the shelf are just the ones that y'all see. I got a whole bunch of other ones too. All right. Um, of course, post-traumatic slave syndrome. I think this almost carries the conversation about the Botham John response as far as the family. This is a great book. It, it, that whole idea of like Stockholm syndrome and pretty much understanding the concept of why black America is the way it is and how slavery really still plays a role in everything that happens even in 2019. Um, so this is always a good one. I'll make sure y'all can see full. All right. Tennessee Coates, we are eight years in power. This is just about the experience, or not the experience, but the years that Barack Obama was in office. All of his books, I, I like Between the World and Me a little bit more, even though it's more like a, a letter or essay. This is Tennessee Coates again as well. This is an interesting book, just talking about, I guess, actually, there's a lot. Hold on. What, there's a part in here. Um, I just got to see if I can find it. I never do like click notes because I don't like writing in the books because everybody's always following my books. Um, I'll come back to it, but all right. Um, Bleeding Out, I literally just bought this, so I haven't even read it yet. So if y'all have read this, please tell me how this is. Um, Bleeding Out, Devastation Consequences of Urban Violence and a Bold New Plan for Peace in the Streets. Bleeding Out, this is by Thomas App. I have not even got the chance to look at this yet. It still, it still smells new. Like, I literally bought this at San Sankofa, down the street from Howard, maybe a month ago. Um, we talked about this one before, Matthew Delmont, Why Busing Failed. It's just talking about how, like, because even in 2019, schools are actually more segregated now than they were back then. And it's just talk, it's about busing and how this kind of contributed to something like white flight as well. So that's a book to read. This is a fun one. Well, it's not, it's not fun, but it was a good read. Parliamentarianism and the Assault on the Democracy of Haiti. Y'all know I, I reference Haiti a lot on this channel just because, I don't know, maybe they just got a place in my heart. And so um, who is this by again? Jeb Sprague. Or Sprague, I said his name wrong. Um, pretty much just talking about all of the leaders that they've had in that country and how everything is still a hot mess over there, unfortunately. And why things are just still going the way they are. Like, even when you talk about the earthquake they had in 2010, they're still rebuilding almost 10 years later. And then because there's no money, there's no money to do the infrastructure. And then there's a conversation about the trees because people keep saying they don't got no trees over there because they did all the, the lumber and everything. And when you talk about the fact that there was an embargo on Haiti and that they weren't allowed to trade with the rest of the world or any of the countries that were in alignment with the United States, it just really messed up the economy they had. But, you know, so that's a book. We talk about this one too A Sick Life. T Boss from TLC. It's a fun book to I, I like the book more on Audible because it was kind of funny listening to her read it. Um, because she's kind of funny. So some of those stories in there are, are hilarious. And my, I didn't know she fought so much. Like, man, she was fighting in every chapter. Like for her to be such a tiny person, she had a lot of fight in her. Um, this next book, High Rises, Ben Austin. This is talking about the construction of like high rises as well as private, not private, public housing. I think we talked about the initial origins of public housing and how initially it wasn't the high rises at first it was kind of like you know there was a lumber shortage during world war ii so people couldn't just go and buy houses so initially like public housing and everything like that was for white people for white families who want a single family home they didn't have enough lumber because you needed the lumber to go and support all the troops because we we're at war and the whole country was at war and so they started building public housing which was kind of like makeshift housing something real cheap just to hold well not super cheap um, it was still decent because, you know, they had nice grass and a little playground and everything, but families could live there until the war was over and there was no longer a lumber shortage and then they could go get their homes built. So initially the idea of public housing was kind of just something temporary. And so if you look at the structures of the early public housing, where most of them no longer exist, they've been torn down, they were usually one or two story buildings, sometimes maybe three. Then came the, the larger high rises. And that came because around the time that you had redlining really kicking into play, at this point, World War II is over. A lot of these families have left and they, they've gone and started building their own homes in single family homes in different areas and everything like that. And the housing, the need for housing starts to increase because the population of the country is increasing. The cost of living is going up, especially in the 70s and the 80s. And so they couldn't build these same kind of, you know, public housing spaces that were one or two stories and spread out over massive plots of land because the city needed the land because they had infrastructure and they had industry and everything like that. So they decided, well, instead of building out, build up. And so... That's how you got those big high rises like the Marcy projects and everything like that in Brooklyn or some of the projects in, in, in Chicago. And that's how you got them to be so high. And so just and they're all and you notice they're usually all kind of concentrated in one specific area or you talk about the high rises in the Bronx. Like that's how that started. Um, Y'all know that we spend a lot of time on Flint. If you ever look at my description, every video I've posted for the last two years has a link to the Flint right water crisis and support that you can give. This is called a poison city. All right, from Ann Clark. This is talking about Flint. This is talking about just pretty much the origins of how everything happened. And when you look in the details and the fact that literally the only reason they have a water crisis is because of greed. 
not because the water was trash, because they weren't even getting their water out of the Flint River. It was coming out of a different river. And then long story short, when you talk about the, the mayor and the governor, all of them have legal contracts, and they pretty much just decided to switch the water source because they wanted to have a new piping project and some other nonsense and some other crap. And so pretty much you had greedy people that did some stupid things, and the next thing you know, Flint water is trash, and they still can't fix it. Um, because at this point, the whole population has been contaminated and all the kids got lead poisoning. We know that lead poisoning is irreversible when you talk about the damages. So I know a lot of those children have behavior problems in class now. Um, so much to be said. Anyway, we're going to wrap in a few minutes. So let me just look at a few more comments. I'm so sorry that I didn't really get a chance to talk and, and respond to a lot of the comments, but we didn't really have the nice two, three hour block that we normally have. So I'm going to kind of scroll through a few more. Um, Mm -hmm. No one is facing that for chemical warfare. Do you think Lauren Hill can make a comeback with music, um, or with a music book or biopic documentary? Um, Lauren Hill would still have supporters. It wouldn't be to the extent that you know, as far as her fame in like from 1998 to about 2000, it wouldn't be of that caliber. But people would still support her. I think she has an interesting story to tell. Um, so yeah, somebody said, please send me greetings from Monterey, Mexico. Hey, I know this is sound this sounds really random, and don't judge me, but I was just watching the Selena concert clip from Monterey. <laughs> <laughs> on my lunch break today. <laughs> so shout out to Monterey. Um, yeah, it was this random Selena clip. She was performing. Um, this is fun. I, was it Monterey? It might have been somewhere else. She was performing Como La Flor. And the funniest thing was like, while she's singing it, all these fans keep running on the stage. And, and mind you, she, she would keep singing and hugging and kissing do, 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 and keep singing. And I, and then like, and but these people just kept coming on the stage and, and she would not like, um, you know, security wasn't yanking them off, and she allowed them to say it was the most interesting thing. I was like, hmm, interesting. Um, somebody said, let me keep going. Uh, so shout out to Mexico. Um, water crisis. Where am I at? Where am I at? I need a mic. Can y'all hear me? I feel like y'all can hear me, unless you're talking about, like, a microphone. I don't know. Um, let's see. Where am I at? Somebody, I just, oh, are you going to support the Harriet movie? Uh... I don't know. I'm kind of tired of, I mean, I, I think the story needs to be told, but from what I've read about the lead actress and some of the things that she has said about Black Americans, it's kind of like, hey, you don't need to be in that role, in my opinion, but I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Um, I got. I, I don't have my opinion locked down yet. I got to do a little bit more research before I you know, put my two cents in, but I do think the story needs to be told. Um, hey, Calvin, have you read A World More Concrete? Real oh, shit, this thing just scrolled up. Um, a world more concrete real estate and the remaking of Jim Crow South Florida. Oh, thank you for that recommendation. I will gladly look at that, Chris. Um, can we have a movie where the black woman isn't struggling? Yeah, I would like to have a fun movie. Maybe maybe Hollywood should actually pick up some of my scripts that I have. I have some comedies waiting in the deck. Um, um, all right, we're almost done here. Calvin Michael, do you think the pop sound trend will make a comeback on the Billboard Hot 100? What's your thoughts on it? I think with pop music, and it's funny, I just watched, um, Backstreet Boys had that documentary on who it came out like three years ago. I just watched that. The pop sound as far as that whole bubblegum, 1999, the 2001 Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys, NSYNC bubblegum sound, I don't think that's ever going to make a comeback. If it does ever make any kind of comeback, it would have been in the form of what Katy Perry was doing before 2012. Right now, all the pop acts, like I said before, they've hopped on to the more R&B influenced sound. So the R&B acts can't get, can't catch a break. The pop acts are just doing their sound, or they're infusing their stuff with hip hop. Like if you look at somebody like Ariana Grande, Ar Ariana Grande, I want to say Grande, whatever her name is, um, you know, great singer and everything. But if you look at her image and how it shifted in the last few years, um, you see where the sounds are going. So, boom. There we go. So I, I don't know. With pop music, I don't think it, it, if it does make a comeback, it'll make a comeback with children. You know, children will always support anything that's whimsical. So, um, but with adults, no. Because it, it's even weird. Like, you look at all those pop stars from back then, and none of them really here. Britney was touring in, in Vegas, but she has all the stuff that's going on up here. Christina has really had a hard time coming back into that realm of success. People appreciate her voice, but people aren't buying her music. Backstreet Boys are old at this point uh, for pop music. Same with NSYNC. And, and even Justin Timberlake, nobody was really checking for the last project. So, um, I don't know where that goes. Um, Cree Summers, Cree Summers. Why do I know that name? Cree Summers, Cree Summers. I gotta look it up. Y'all got, got me on that one. I gotta go back. Um, 
I'm confused with with Fantasia's material. She wants to make different genres genres with the new album, but the last two have been the same rap stuff. I loved enough though. She did say she didn't like her last album and that they tried to experiment and do different things. And so I'm hoping if she does with this new album that's coming out, I'm hoping it's more along the lines of the Free Yourself album, or I'll even take another side effects of you type album, minus her saying the F word three times. It made no sense. Um, but yeah, I would like to see Fantasia's next project. Um, Trey Songs, what did he do now? He did something. Trey Songs, what does he do? He's been kind of quiet. I haven't heard from him in a while. Somebody said, Me, me too. I don't know nothing about that one. I don't know what happened. Um, we're talking about different world. What's going on? Oh, this is Freddie from a different world. Wait, I'm missing something. Y'all talking? Yeah, SoundCloud artists are the new thing. It's SoundCloud. A lot of people are getting signed through SoundCloud. I should actually utilize mine. My SoundCloud is really my podcast. I don't even have my music on there. Or I have like three or four songs from my first album on there that I forgot were on there. I don't even use the SoundCloud because Spotify is my go-to. Like I like Spotify because if you don't even pay for Spotify, people can still use it. So I usually send people to that as opposed to Apple Music. By the way, I did like that. Um, for those who, if you follow me, I, I did post that link to that R&B playlist with a bunch of songs. I updated it earlier this morning. So now it's at like 2,000 songs. So um, if you look on my community page, I think the post before the one where I said I was going live, it has, um, you know, a, a link to that Spotify playlist. And it's a combination of songs between 1970 and the present. Just a bunch of R&B classics, some underrated songs, some songs that I think are gems, and then just some songs I think people should check out. So if you're really an R&B head, you just like music, you like to hear a bunch of different stuff, definitely check out that playlist. Um, let's see, where are we at? We're almost done. I'm going to set my clock because I know I'll be here till midnight, even though I said it's 1030 and it's time to get off. We'll go for about six more minutes all right six is a fun number all right what else do we got here um i support fantasia's comments on relationships there's nothing wrong with her letting a man take charge and still do her own thing with relationships i think everybody just has to do what works for them i don't think there's a one-size-fits-all relationships that's why I, like i don't give relationship advice because i'm the worst one with it my relationships be a hot freaking mess so um uh, with relationships again i think it, it's you do what works for you you do what works for the good of that relationship or who you're with um so i think everybody's experience is different um is your song addicted on your playlist on spotify no see i was trying to not be cocky and put my music in that playlist so i just put all the other artists and i kept my music separate because some of you guys don't like my music like that so it's like i don't want to bombard you with my sound um by the way I'm almost done editing it, but I have a video coming out that explains how I made every song on the album. It's kind of a fun video. It goes behind the scenes of, you know, how I, how, how I made the tracks, what inspired what song. There's some, like, behind-the-scenes footage of me recording it or just the people that were recording it, so that's coming out, too. Um, I didn't like A. Marie's a, uh, EP like that. Alan, I love A. Marie, but I when I think of A. Marie, I need the, the pots and pans crashing, and I need the screeching sounds. She, I need all of that. The album was really mellow. There were some nice songs on it, but I like energetic Amory, not laid back Amory. Maybe she needs to take the second eye out of her name and put it back to one. Um, yeah. Um, the impeachment thing with Trump, I already said, I don't think it's going to go all the way through. We'll see. Uh, but again, there's already a door that's been opened with all that. So even if he's out of there, it's not going to really change much. America's already a mess to begin with. It's just going to be worse. Oh, Cree Summers from Different World. Okay. What, 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 what did she do? What's going on with Cree? She has an album? Oh, yeah, Freddie. Why didn't I know that? Yeah, because she was Susie on Rugrats, right? Um, she did the voiceover for Susie. She was the voiceover on... There's another show. She was on a bunch of shows, actually. She was the girl... What's that show? As Told by Ginger? She was the black girl on the show? No, it wasn't As Told by Ginger. It's one of them shows. Oh, hell, it's a lot of them shows. Does she have an album? Somebody, um... Oh, I didn't know she had an album. Interesting. Let me look that up. Okay. Look at y'all teaching me something new today. Cree Summers. The different world. All right. Um, Lenny Kravitz did it. What? Why don't I know this? Look at me learning something new. Good job. Who, who said that? Shout out to uh, Poison Ivy. You are right, learn something new. Um, Trump about to be reelected. Dems can't win with 75 different candidates. I already said I am not impressed by most of the candidates they have. It's gonna be we will see what happens. I I don't know, y'all. We'll see. We shall see. Go ahead, Lenny Kravitz. I did not know that. Um, PJ Morton, I haven't listened to his whole album yet. I did 
uh, I, I saw he was doing the work with JoJo, so I do want to check that out. Um, how do you find the time to complete all of your creative projects and read books? What is your schedule like? A freaking mess. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to do a better job of being centered because I'm kind of all over the place. It's it, it looks cool from the outside. Like, oh, he's doing a podcast. And he has an album and he does scripts and he had a web series and he does dance and he, he does comedy. And he does it, it looks cool, but it's I'm all over the place. It is so hard for me to kind of lock down and keep everything consistent. And so I'm trying to fall back from some projects and spend more time on others. So for the last two years, my main goal was let me put more energy into the YouTube channel and let me also focus on the music. So I've kind of stepped back from some other things. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot. And then I work with kids too. And then they take up some of my weekends and then you, you do a lot of off this clock hours doing stuff with them. Um, Cause you got your seniors that are in high school and you might be taking them to the college fair on a Saturday or uh, you, it's a lot. I don't get a lot of um, free time sometimes. Like my days normally end at one o'clock in the morning every day. Um, and then like with the, with YouTube, I'll be honest, I hate making the end of news videos. Those are my least favorite ones to make. I absolutely hate them because they take the most time. Like when I first started the channel back in the day, before I had the, the, the mic and all that stuff, I, um, I could just do my little flip camera, say my two cents, go to bed. And then, of course, as we grew and people were like, oh, can you fix the sound? Or can you give us some visual support? Or can you talk about this? Can you talk about that? And it got to, can you talk about a million things? So I was like, well, let's put like a million things in one video and just knock it all out. So I love recording the end of news, but then you got to edit it. I was like, man, this crap take all day. And then, you again, you have to be selective with what stories you're going to talk about. And then you also have to be mindful that you don't want to hop on a story too fast because the details may change right after you post it. So, you know, but in the news, I think is, is, is the favorite on here. That and R&B is dead. So those are the two that I'm going to, I can never dunk pretty much. Um, mm, 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 mm. All right. So I really don't have that. I really don't have that kind of time. I think it takes a toll on my social life. I don't get to go out as much as I would like to. Um, somebody said, you remind me of Tevin Campbell from his Back to the World era. And you think, do you think Tevin Campbell and Brandon should do a joint album? I'll say maybe the Tevin Campbell for the hair, not the voice. I, I can't compete in the room with Tevin Campbell vocally. Him and Brandy, that would be a fun album to listen to. Some good vocals. Um, really great vocals. Um, let's see. Um, please upload in the news videos more often. Didn't I just say they take all day to do? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. When I do those in the news videos, some days I don't even, like you notice, they normally get uploaded at one or two or three in the morning if you're on the East Coast. That's literally when they get uploaded. Because then after you do the video and you go and find all the clips and the pictures and the supporting evidence and everything, then you got to compress the video because my in the news videos have gotten longer over the last year. They started out being, oh, that's my time. They started out being 10, 15 minutes. Now they're leaning closer to 30 and 40. They take a lot of time. So. Ah, uh, get on my nerves. All right, we'll do three more questions, then I'm out of here. Lion, I like Lion Babe. Vanessa Williams' daughter? Yeah, she's great. I like her. Um, are you ever going to do a show? I need to. Oddly enough, I had signed on 93.9, the radio station out here, um, had a competition where you could submit songs, you know, for a chance to be on the radio. I didn't know it was to be on the radio and perform at some show. And then when I looked at who was on the show, it was like all these trap artists. So then I was like, oh, hell, I don't want to win this because they're going to boo me. Nobody wants to hear R&B at a trap show. So I was so happy I didn't win. I was like, thank God. <sighs> no, I'm not married yet. Um, I'm not there. Somebody else asked, um, but I, I would like to do a show. So I got to do something. I'm, I, I suck at promoting my own music. Um, I just don't have the time to really do it like I would like to. And then the other thing, working with kids and having to project your voice all day for like eight hours. By the time you get off, your voice is tired. And so it's like some days I don't even have a voice when I get home. So it's like, man. Um, somebody said Black Flight is my favorite song off your album. That's my, that actually Black Flight wasn't even, it, it's an interlude. It actually was a fuller song, but um, we'll talk about it in a different video. All right, one last one here. Um, Pat, can we please talk about what you're reading? I just kind of need some suggestions. I don't know if you just got here, but in the, somewhere in the middle of the video, we talk about some of the books. But what I'm currently reading, I told you guys I've been on my Toni Morrison binge. Um, I've been trying to catch up on all of her books. So right now I'm finishing Blue Eye. Um, I had to take a break because I was doing some other things. And then after that, I'm going to go to the Sula. Um, and then I'll go to Beloved. I think I already read Beloved before, and I remember the movie, but I want to read it again. All right, folks. Oh, yes, J-Law. I'm glad you asked. Do you have a link for the interview um, you did in the Bay? Am I able to type it in here? Let me see if I can click it over real quick. I totally forgot to add that in, but it was from the KPFA 
radio station. Let me see if it's on here. I don't know if you can still see me because I'm on a different window right now. Um, I'm going to post the link in the comments section real quick if, I, if this opens. Um, schedule, schedule, programs. Yeah, so it actually aired on the 26th. Shout out to, um, Lord, I can't even get the lady's name right. Forgive me for messing up her name. Queen, Queen Janine. Queen Janine, that's her name. Shout out to her for letting me be on her show. I was on her radio show. Um, when was I on it? I was on the show back in July, and it, it just aired in April. Hold on, guys. I'm trying to find the episode real quick. It, the show is called The Chocolate. Um, chocolate something. Hold on, I'm going to find it real quick. Damn, where was it at? I just had it. Uh, all right, let's see. Actually, hey, she just emailed me, actually. Let me send the link real quick. Sorry, guys. Give me one second. Um, uh, Boom. Here we go. Come on, Gmail. Now, Gmail wouldn't be slow. Janine, Janine, where you at, Norman? Uh, switch accounts. Not get to it. Where is it at? Oh, um, release elements. Where is it at? Okay, I'll do this because I can't find it right now. Um, I will add it to my community. Oh, is this it? Yeah, no, I'd be messing up stuff. Schedule. Here we go. Um, we need to go back to. Here we go. September twenty sixth. Sorry, I'm over here trying to maneuver the, their website. Um, mind you, I did not know the show would air <laughs> at like, uh, midnight. And so the host had this really beautiful midnight, sexy radio voice that you, that's very soothing and kind of just has everything here. And then, you know, my loud animated self was on the show. Oh, what was the album? I, I worked on this song. We did this. I was like, yo, you sounded like that at midnight on them people over there. <laughs> I just had to laugh. Uh, yeah, that's funny. But um, come on, man. This thing is not popping up. Pacific, Pacific, Pacific. Damn. I'm going to find this thing because I just. Okay, I'll post it in the community section. I don't want to keep holding out too long. Anyway, but yeah. Anyway, this has been real, folks. We'll do another one of these in a few weeks. Um, It's homecoming season. Are you going? I. Ooh, am I going to homecoming? If I go, I'll go to tailgate, maybe. I wasn't really planning. Um. Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation concert. I didn't get to go because I went to Metamorphosis, but it seems like it was kind of a, con a continuation of that show, but scale to fit in the arena, so it looked like it was a pretty fun show. Um, I think she's about to take a break, I think. Um, um, all right, we are out of here. It's been real. Um, I will upload a podcast episode so Friday, the thing is, I want to add the other Howard University episodes, but the thing is, like, some of the people that I'm talking about in the episodes still work there, and I would like for them to still have their jobs, so it's kind of like I've been just pushing everybody to go to the platforms that it's on, because I know when I put it on YouTube, it's going to get so much traction, especially my senior and junior year episodes. There's some stories up in there, but so definitely check out the podcast on, on the actual platforms, um, and then... I was trying to figure out what was the next song I was going to post from my album on the channel. I was thinking The Affirmation. That's one of my favorite ones. But a lot of you guys really enjoyed um, Jada Do, Jada Blue, which I didn't even think was going to bang like that. So we'll see. Anyway, this has been Real Guys. So good night. Be safe. Um, what is this? Calvin Michael, Why Don't Billboard, No, Bubblegum, Chop. We'll, we'll talk on that. Um, anyway, um, can you talk about the experience of your uncle's funeral in L.A. on your podcast? Y'all be remembering stuff, huh? Anyway, all right, we'll talk about it. Anyway, I'm out, guys. Good night. Um, I will post a link to my radio interview. You're gonna have to fast forward to like 50 minutes into the show, though, because it's like she's playing like all the nice quiet storm music, and then my interview. We did like a, an hour and a half interview. Um, she took about 10 minutes of it. I think she was saying she would use the second part later on. I don't know. We'll see. But in that specific interview, it's really me just talking about my music. So we'll do that. I'm out. So I was gonna say subscribe, but I guess if you're watching, you subscribe. So good night. And in.